there's a little restaurant, and there and then there's a liquor store, and the liquor store was booming. <laughs> mm -hmm. It used to be in the uh, previous days, in the time of Washington and Jefferson, that politicians would buy and dispense booze to get votes. We've now progressed to the point where people buy and dispense booze after <laughs> the votes <laughs> to you know, find some kind of consolation. Um, so I was, I, I was going to go into um, this section of the Six Patriarch Sutra and talk about something I brought up last week, how what is this thing called Buddhism? Um, and frame it, but then I, I'll leave it up to you. I gave, a, I gave a talk a little bit, Doug and I gave a talk uh, two nights ago uh, at the City of 10,000 Buddhas because uh, people needed medicine. <laughs> uh, it was almost like a wake. Uh, they were grieving and whatnot over uh, the recent political thing. So uh, here's the possibility I throw out to you. I could go over and talk about what we talked about that night, which was aimed directly at this, or go right back into the text. It's completely up to you. Uh, a couple people here heard it, so they'll probably be a little bored. Um, won't want to hear it again. You heard it. By the way, we have a webcast to the, the world. You have a problem that we didn't have the webcast, but I know we have it. So is, is that good or bad? <laughs> Um, so I, I really, it, it's completely up to you what, uh, what you'd like to do. Just say and I can go the direction. Deviate. How's that? Deviate. Deviate? Yeah. <laughs> Deviate a little bit and talk about this? Okay. I'll bet you can't do it verbatim from the other man. Uh, not verbatim. And I don't think, as he said, it's, it's a webcast. And... <laughs> There's a few things that probably we said are better not done over the webcast, um, if you get my drift. Um, <laughs> so it was more mostly for uh, people at the City of 10,000 Buddhas, but um, I can share a good deal of that, and I'm sorry for those who have to listen to it twice, so uh, no problem. So if you, if you do, you can just meditate and go into a deep samadhi and forget um, what I said. <laughs> um, well, okay, so, so I started by um, the, the, the feeling after the election was, was palpable, and uh, I would say from the most people I encountered, uh, at least in this area, uh, it was despondency, uh, grief, um, as if somebody had died. And, that, and when there was, and other emotions, very strong emotions. And um, my first response is, I think that's appropriate. I, I don't think you should deny that that's there, cover it over or go tra-la and just move on. I, I think it's, a, it's an appropriate response to a, a situation. It's not like it's um, overreacting. But the difference is where you go once you have that initial reaction. And um, I was thinking of a line, I remember once uh, hearing the Dalai Lama uh, say, because this came up um, in another context where people had high expectations of something happening and it didn't turn out that way. And he simply said something very simple that sort of stuck with me. He says, if you lose, don't lose the lesson. And so where I was going with that was to sort of um, reflect in my own process about what, what lesson I take away. But this led to a deeper reflection that I'll share with you tonight about how I came to be where I am now, sitting in front of you, doing what I'm doing, teaching and uh, running classes and uh, helping with meditation practice and so forth. Um, and I want to say that it was a direct and thoughtful response to the kind of situation that just happened the last couple of days. It wasn't, I'm not here in this way, nor did I become a monk to escape that reality at all. 
uh, which sometimes it can seem like religious life, spiritual life, spiritual practice in general, can seem like a, a um, moving or turning away from the real world. Um, but in fact, it was the real world that brought me here. And I stay here because I th still think um, it's a legitimate and justifiable way to deal with reality. It's not the only way. I, I, never, I don't purport it to be the only way. There's thousands of ways to do it. But I think the most important part is to ask, does it have integrity? Um, does it have inner conviction? And does it have some outward um, possibility of change and transformation, no matter what we're doing? Um, is it good for oneself and good for others? Or the opposite, is it harmful to oneself and harmful to others? So I share with you some of this and I'll tell you how it came about. Um, so I'm going to relate to you a conversation I had with my teacher. This was back in 1977 or so. Um, and it was the longest conversation I ever had with him. Uh, that's because we were stuck in a car driving from Los Angeles to San Francisco uh, on Highway 5. And so that's what? Five hours? I'll tell you why it was only three and a half later, but it was five hours <laughs> as part of the story. Um, and at that time, so the, the, this was a, a big Mercedes Benz car that a laywoman had had. Um, it was one of those big Mercedes Benz. Uh, and there were four people in it, myself, uh, Darmaster Sure, the laywoman who owned the car, her name was Fongo Wu, and then my teacher. Well, Fongo Wu was a very well-to-do um, Vietnamese laywoman, um, very cosmopolitan. She lived and traveled all over, uh, originally from Vietnam, and she, interestingly, was the, the, the laywoman who drove the, the monk who immolated himself, the first monk that immolated himself in Vietnam. Uh, she knew him very closely, uh, was a bit of a disciple of his, and drove him to that site where he uh, did this act. So she's got an interesting background. She's seen quite a bit. Um, but being well-to-do and very spoiled, she didn't know how to drive this car that she bought <laughs> at all. <laughs> and she used to do things. She was so used to, in Vietnam, she's so used to having servants that she'd walk into a store and get her goods and then walk out and just leave her purse sitting on the counter because the attendants always just took care of paying for it. So when she lost the attendant, she had the habit of going in, she'd walk into the store, do this, and walk out, and the tellers would change, no, no, you forgot your purse. Oh, yeah, thank you, thank you. So anyway, she couldn't drive the car. Um, <laughs> Hung Shur was still on his vow of not driving, uh, and Master Wa, of course, didn't drive, so that left me to drive. Uh, now, the reason I'm saying this is because I think the conversation came about because Master Wa saw that I was very sleepy. And since I was the only one that could drive, nodding out at the wheel wasn't an option. So he engaged me in probably conversation. That's my guess, because I don't think I was that interesting to talk to for him. <laughs> Especially as he was asking me to relate you know, a, a portion of my life that, again, wasn't probably interesting to him. He probably knew already anyhow. Um, <laughs> But he, he, you know, he asked me about my, my university years. And so I just started to relate. Um, the, the first thing that I came was, um, I went to the university in uh, 65, 1965, through you know, the next four, five, six, seven, eight, ten 10 years. <laughs> um, but I, I grew up with a, a childhood friend. We were friends since kindergarten. We, we could have been brothers, we were so close. And we went through uh, kindergarten, elementary school, high school together. And then right at graduation, uh, he went off to the military, went off to the war in Vietnam, and I went off to university. And this is the first time we've ever really been apart. And two different paths completely. And within about six or seven months of my first year, I got a, a letter uh, from his mother saying he'd been killed uh, in Vietnam. He, um, interestingly, he was a very, very sweet guy. He was the guy that whenever we have a sports contest or something like that, he'd always pick the kids nobody else would pick to make sure that they got, and they'd be on his team. He didn't care about winning or losing. It was just he was so kind. 
Um, he probably wouldn't have gone off had it not been for his father, and I can say this candidly, his father was a gung-ho World War II bomber pilot, um, super patriotic, and uh, encouraged him to do this, to enlist. He could have gone off to school with me. Um, but as it turned out, the reason he got killed was because uh, there was a dangerous mission. Uh, the other people that were supposed to go were afraid of going, and he knew this, and rather get them in trouble, he just volunteered to go in their stead. Uh, and then he was um, shot out of a helicopter. Um, and it, it was an immense loss to me. It's an immense loss to the country uh, because this was somebody who had gone on to be, done some really good things. And I was devastated by this. My first response was I was going to join up and go. I was going to sign up and go to war. Um, and as I think back about this, and I'm telling Master Wa this, is because I felt I'd let him down. I had abandoned him. Uh, all the time we were growing up, we were arm and our buddies. Um, you know, if we got in a fight with somebody or, you know, whatnot, or swimming, someone was in danger, we, we looked out for each other. And this was the first time I wasn't there, and then I felt responsible to some degree, and I wanted to atone for that. And also I was angry um, for whoever took his life. Um, but as I settled down a little bit, I started to think, well, this won't do any good. It won't bring him back. Um, and going and fomenting these causes and conditions will only increase the possibility that more people like my friend are going to end up in this situation. And so I decided to uh, switch around and devote myself to anti-war. So I went from you know, being a kind of a straight kid out of the Midwest to uh, rather radical in my politics. And it was a reason actually I went into history, because I wanted to figure out what was the cause and effect that led to this. You know, how did he end up in that situation, as, as many of my friends did. So I was, I was really looking into this. And as I got into this radical politics, then I decided I was not going to go to this war. I, I wasn't going to participate in this, because I looked at the history and saw what was going on, and it was murky, to say the least, um, morally and politically in every which way. And so um, I turned my draft card in. As a result, I lost a very promising, lucrative job, um, because it was public knowledge that I was doing this. Um, I alienated a lot of people in my hometown. Uh, where I grew up, but I want to tell you my hometown was the birthplace and uh, anchor spot for Joe McCarthy. So you <laughs> have to understand that it wasn't, easy, it wasn't hard to alienate people in this town if you were opposed uh, to things like this. Um, and as I got into it, um, working towards peace, I saw the peace movement become more violent right within, on my own campus. Um, the free speech movement had started earlier here in Berkeley and had escalated into some pretty heavy-duty violence. Uh, my friends who were at Columbia were very much involved with this, and I was at Madison, and uh, the movement got really uh, vocal, active, and quite violent. And as I saw this happening, I had misgivings about what I was doing. Um, but the, the strongest one came when uh, now, these are friends, I say friends in the movement. You gotta understand, these are not like buddies like my friend Tim was, but these are people that were together in this movement. Uh, decided, and the, and the language at the time was bring the war home. In other words, people here weren't feeling the effects of the war because they were insulated by privilege, prestige, um, and so on and so forth. So to feel that full effect of the impact of the war, you brought, the idea was to bring the war home and create the kind of violence and tension uh, that was there abroad. And, and stop business as usual was the other expression at the university um, because the university was either directly or indirectly involved in supporting the war. To give you an example, at my, my campus, um, there was a land tenure center and the land tenure center received money from, which would then be um, the CIA, to generate um, deeds of land ownership, which they then uh, would put a little computers on backs of Jeeps and go into Bolivia and crank these land ownership deeds to give to the peasants so the peasants felt that they actually owned their land. They, were, they weren't worth the paper they were written on. At the same time, um, another component in technology was developing this high infrared um, 
cameras that could basically, from very high, high elevation planes, you could look down and see and basically pick up someone smoking a cigar in the jungle. And so the combination of these two things they used to take out Che Guevara. In other words, they undermined the base of, by panning out the, the land ownership things, and then they used this um, high technology to go and, and take him out. And so there was, again, people started to realize this. And then the other thing that was happening was the anthropology department, which was my major, my minor, um, was doing studies of um, leadership and clan and tribal things, uh, again, for the CIA. And it wasn't impartial anthropology. It was to figure out the authority chain so that when they would go in, they could take out who the leadership was. And they, they wanted to know who, who to take out and who not. So this is quite upsetting when you thought about the neutrality of intellectual inquiry. Anyhow, um, one of the major buildings involved in this was called the Army Math Research Center. So it was devoted to math and I think, what's the word they use there? Uh, Stanford had one of these, it's called, um, where they use mathematics to map out uh, probabilities for oil and operations research, is that? Yeah. yeah, it was called operations research. And so this was, they were doing it there. So these people in the movement a couple of weeks earlier had decided to uh, sabotage. You know sabotage? Yeah, it's from the French, sabat, which is? My, Chinese, my French is probably as good as my Chinese. Sabat is a shoe. It's usually a wooden shoe, but it's sabat. And it comes from, uh, in the early part of, of France's history, uh, when uh, people wanted to stop industrialization, they would take off their shoe and jam it into the machine. And the machine would then shut down. And that's why sabotage comes about. So they decided to sabotage um, a munition, uh, munitions factory just outside of Madison, a place called Baraboo, huge um, underground, above ground munitions factory that was making all the bullets. And so they got a single engine Cessna plane, they made their own little bomb, and they flew over this and dropped it out. Fortunately, it didn't go off. I mean, because the amount of damage, it would be half the state of Wisconsin. Now, some of you are thinking, well, Wisconsin went this way, so it went a bit. No, don't go there, <laughs> all right? <laughs> and it didn't go off. But then, undeterred by that, a couple weeks later, they basically did a Timothy McVeigh thing where they loaded a van up with uh, you know, explosives and fertilizer, backed it up to this Army Math Research Center, and detonated it. And it basically took out a half a block of campus in that building. Um, and I remember going there in the morning, and the chi, the energy, was just, it did bring the war home. But it brought home the mind of war, and not just the war. And I started to see the anger, the hatred, the violence, and the, and the tactics that were being used were the same things that were being used there. And it was, you know, people thought, well, different ends. But in both cases, the ends justified the means. And I thought, wait a minute, I can't go down this road. And the sad thing was there was a physicist, a young physicist in the building at the time, married with two kids, and he was killed. And so now you got the loss of him to his family, um, and he interestingly was against the war. So I started to, at this point, I really turned away um, from this, which kind of left me adrift because I didn't know really what I could do. Um, another incident that along these lines, I'm telling Master Wa this, and I'm sort of looking through the rearview mirror, and he's going, mm, mm-hmm, mm. And Hung Shri is staying awake to translate, because he doesn't speak English, and I don't speak Chinese. And so Hung Shri is getting this whole story. He's the intermediary. Fang Gu, of course, is asleep. <laughs> and, the, and so, uh, and, mm -hmm. and I said, so one thing that happened was we had a very radical group, and we were committed to civil disobedience, not to violent action, but to civil disobedience. And so we decided to block um, an interview on campus uh, conducted by Dow Chemical for looking for students for their company. And some of you might remember, any of you remember what Dow Chemical was doing back in 19... Angel Orange. Huh? Angel Orange. Angel Orange, for sure, but something else. Napalm. Napalm. And some of you remember that the image that I remember that really struck me, got me out to do this, was that image of that girl running down the road with her skin melting off of her because she had been napalmed. 
Um, and so uh, this was fresh in my mind. And so we all agreed that we were going to lock arms and block the entryway for the interviews and, and you know, take whatever came. And there were 12 of us. Actually, there were 13, but 12 went to the demonstration. The 13 person wasn't there. And the 13 person was the one who had organized this animated us to do this, got us all, you know, charged up to the barricades, you know, and off we go. And so 11 people were arrested. They didn't arrest me. They unlocked everybody's arms, they handcuffed them, took them away, and I'm sitting there, hey! And the paddy wagon draws out, and I go, hey! You know? And so I think, wow, well, what I need to do now, because the, the atmosphere at the time was very nasty, and the police, um, this was before 68 in Chicago, but the police were very keen on taking their revenge out on the people they arrest in jail and in the paddy wagon on the way there. And these men and women students, friends of mine, so I go to find the 13th person to say, we need to raise bail bond money to get them out immediately because them staying overnight in this county jail is not good. Um, and so, in fact, the police were wearing, you know, basically wearing badges, and we were wearing stop the war. They were saying, start the war. So it was, a, <laughs> it was a very, very tense atmosphere. And I couldn't find, so I went to the administration building. It was locked in by a thousand some people that occupied the whole building. And so I'm saying, where's Aaron? Where's Aaron? He said, oh, he's, he's upstairs. He's upstairs. You know, he's the leader. So I go crawling over people. Hey, yeah, what are you doing? Yeah, I got to get people out of jail. And I go into the chancellor's office, and I'm getting to the chancellor's office, and I smell cigar smoke. And I thought, wow. I knew the chancellor, I knew he didn't smoke. And, but he was, his office was occupied, he wasn't there. When I walked in, there was Aaron sitting in the chancellor's desk, leaning back with his feet on the desk, smoking a cigar and holding forth the philosophy of nonviolence and peace and so forth, power to the da, da, da. And I thought, whoa, this is just like Animal Farm. You know, all you do, all you do is you switch the leaders, but it's the same power tripping and it's the same you know, self-aggrandizement and whatnot. I just looked and I thought, I'm out of here, I can't do this. Because what am I working for? If it's just to replace the same minds that have you know, brought us in this situation, this is gonna go on endlessly. And so at that point I just, uh, I pulled out of it. And, uh, and, the, uh, and the master's in the back going, hmm, mm-hmm, yeah, hmm. How, you know, like good. Oh, okay. So I'm encouraged to go on. So then I said, well, then I decided to work with children because I figured I could work at the root of something here and get it before it got to this level. Um, and so, but I worked with the severely emotionally disturbed children and um, we would work with the kids and after six or seven months with therapy and kindness and caring, we'd get them pretty healthy again and send them back to their families. Within three to four months, they'd be back with us again, completely messed up. And we started to go, duh, what's going on here? And we realized that the families, the parents, were the problem, not the kids. The kids were actually not so bad. But they were learning dysfunction within a dysfunctional family. So we changed our program to add this whole dimension of teaching parents how to be parents. But when I went into that, I saw that these parents were just continuing the habit energies from their parents and their unexamined lives and their raw thoughts and emotions that weren't cultivated at all. And they were just passing on. I thought, whoa, whoa, whoa. All of this is pointing back to the mind. You know, it's all pointing back to the mind. I gotta find some way to get into the mind if I'm gonna cause change to happen because without the mind turning, none of this in the world is gonna turn. This is the seed of everything. And basically, uh, that led me to Gold Mountain Monastery along with other things. And so the master's going, hmm, hmm, how, how, good, 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 you know. And, you know, but he never really opened his eyes. He's just listening. And um, so then, he said, so, but you went back to the university for your PhD. I said, uh, yeah. And so what did you study? I said, well, I studied American foreign policy because uh, I was, you know, my friend Tim was killed by American foreign policy, so I want to figure it out. And I went right to the Kennedy years, which was the years in which the involvement there became massive. And he said, and what did you find? I said, I was really discouraged. And he said, why? I said, well, first of all, all the information I wanted was blacked out in the documents mm -hmm. in the interest of national security. And it probably saved me because it would have been so depressing to read what was actually going on. But what I discovered, I said, was really disturbing, Master. And he said, well, what, what, what was it? I said, well, I thought Kennedy was an honorable and virtuous president. And that was the image that I had. But I said, when I looked closely, I saw on one hand, 
He was, because he created this thing called the Peace Corps. And it was really an innovative program to go help um, people uh, abroad that were in poverty or economic uh, distress and so forth. Uh, I said, but then on the other side, less known, he created um, a counterinsurgency group, including Black Ops and the Green Berets, so to go in <laughs> and do the opposite. And so there was like, there was two things going on hand in hand. On the surface, it looked like generous foreign policy was being given. On the other hand, it was being undermined by this. And then I said, you know, and then I discovered that there are all these strings attached to the foreign policy because they were actually only giving it to people who were friendly to specific American interests and those who weren't, even though they were popular and democratic, they were actually taking out with these black ops and Green Berets as close to home as Central America, not to mention, you know. And so I said, wow, and, he's, and then Sherfolk sort of perked up a little bit and he said, hmm. He says, that's called the thief amid the virtue. And this is a, this is a Chinese expression. I don't know how to render it exactly. What do you, what do you think it means? How would you trans... Okay. What does that mean to you? Yeah, how would you render it so, in, in English, common English? I mean, does that make sense to you if I just say the thief in the virtue? Kind of? Oh, okay. It's, let's say virtue is a huge water balloon, and it's full, and then you got a little pinprick, and it it's drips out. Um, so the thief in the virtue has this idea that Although it's good in many ways, there's also some ulterior motive or something that's off, a little distorted, that then takes away from and depletes the virtue, doesn't make it whole and complete. Sometimes this is rendered in terms of karma. Uh, you have good karma, but then right within that good karma, there's an intention um, not quite right, and so it doesn't turn out to be completely good. It's murky, it's mixed. Um, so he said, that's the thief amid the virtue. And I thought, wow, I hadn't thought about it that way. Uh, and I said, well then, Master, how do, you, how do you build your virtue? How do you cultivate virtue? Because I was thinking that would be the opposite. He said, you don't. I said, what? So now the conversation is really starting to take place. I'm sure it's starting to translate. And he says, um, you, you don't build virtue. You keep it from draining away. You remove the thieves. Because your virtue is whole and complete as it is. Don't you understand? When it says all beings have the Buddha nature, all can become Buddhists, it means the virtuous nature is whole and complete. Well, I said, how does it drain away? He said, I've told you this so many times, I'll tell you again. Five ways. Greed, fighting, seeking, selfishness, and self-benefit. He says, if you're motivated by those, the virtue drains away, you harm yourself, and he said, actually, you do more harm to others. So simply catch those things, and it won't happen. Now, some of you know that these are, quote, part of what's called the six principles, and I only quoted five because at the time there was only five. <laughs> it took another incident in Canada to create the six, which is not lying. That's not for tonight, that's another story. <laughs> but at this time there were only the five. And so then I said, well, Sherful, you know, we were in the movement, uh, we were involved with um, religious groups as well, um, Catholics and Christians on campus. We formed a, a religious against the war movement. And we would go into churches. Um, I got a Jesuit priest here tonight. You'll appreciate this. We'd go into churches, and right in the middle of Mass, right when communion was starting, we'd all stand up and hold up signs protesting the war. And one of the signs was, uh, love of country above God is idolatry. Yeah. <laughs> so we, we were really, uh, and this was a carryover for liberation theology. Uh, priests and nuns who had been involved in the civil rights movement now moved into this anti-war movement. And I said, but we used to have really, really deep discussions at night. And uh, some of the people in the group would say, virtue's good, but it's not enough. There has to be direct action. There has to be confrontation. Sometimes there even has to be blood. And so I was like, oh, I don't know. And so I said, Matt, I, sure, what do you think of that? Virtue's not enough. And without blinking an eye, he said, mm, mm -hmm. not enough virtue. <laughs> Whoa, <laughs> I was like, what? I mean, just switch those around. I said, what do you mean, I'm sure? He, he said, I'll give you an example. And then he quoted from a Confucian story. I, I don't know, maybe you can find the story for next week. But basically, it's a story 
where a disciple asked Confucius about when you're trying to change the world and change government and so forth, uh, Confucius, you recommend virtue, dao de. Um, but you know, sometimes you need more. Sometimes you have to use violence or force to get rid of a bad ruler and so forth. And then Confucius gave this example. He says, if a house is on fire and burning, and you take you know, like a little Chinese teacup of water and throw it on the fire, and the fire doesn't go out, do you conclude that fire doesn't overcome water? And the disciple said, well, no. And the Confucius said, well, what was the problem? You didn't use enough water. He said, in the same way, in transforming society, um, you have to increase the amount of virtue. Don't conclude that virtue isn't you know, enough. Conclude that you haven't used enough virtue. And this, this metaphor, this analogy, really stuck in my mind um, as, as the master uh, brought it out. And so then I was at that time had gotten very excited about Confucian texts. And so I was studying Confucian texts. It's very, very interesting how he would take what you were studying at the time and then use it as a vehicle to teach you. And the thing I want to point out is even though he was a very gifted teacher, very eloquent, and able to hold your attention and teach you without using any script or text, he always used text to make his point. And he, every day he would lecture these texts two or three times a day. And it was almost as if he was pointing us to the text rather than to himself as the authority. And it's very interesting. And he would ask us questions, what do you think it means? Well, if it meant that, how could it say this and so forth? But it wasn't about him, it was about these texts. So that's why we made classical text at the core of what we're doing here because we're following that model. Um, and so he quoted, and I'll, I wasn't, but I'll quote you this section because it's really interesting. This is from um, the one I was studying at the time, actually, and it's, uh, it's called the, the Da Shui. Uh, literally translates as here as great learning, but it's also the, the two characters that are used for a university. A university is a Da Shui. So, but this refers to basically when it says great learning means what's the highest form of learning? What's the highest form of learning? And in this text, the text starts with Confucius saying that the, um, the first stage of learning is not the acquisition of knowledge or even erudition or, or the ability to argue, but ming ming de, and translated by, is to make yourself radiant with bright virtue, to develop your character, your moral and wholesome qualities. Once your person is developed in this way, then the acquisition of knowledge can become an effective tool for transformation. Without that, knowledge becomes a dangerous weapon. And so this ancient text goes back and says, this is what's the most important thing. And um, then Master said, but in this, now listen to this. He said, this is what you want to think about. And I'm going to read the text directly. The ancients who wish to radiate with this bright virtue, wished it to radiate throughout the kingdom. In other words, to be the quality of the country. We got a ways to go, but <laughs> that's what they wished for. If they wished for that, they first well-ordered their own states. And wishing to well-order, to improve their own states, they then well-ordered and took care of their families. And wishing to regulate and, and uplift their families, they cultivated first their persons. So you see, it's going from macro back. And then it says, wishing to cultivate their persons, they then trued their hearts or rectified their minds. And you think, okay, it stops there, but it doesn't. And it says, wishing to true their hearts, rectify their minds, they first thought to be sincere in their thoughts. And uh, the master then asked me in the car, so do you know what sincere means? And I gave my standard definition. It's like, you don't put on any, any false front. Inside and outside are the same. He says, no. He said, if inside is really bad and outside the same, that's not sincerity. <laughs> and then at this time, this was after Charlie Manson. And it's very funny. And Hung Shui's going, what? Shui says, Charlie Manson was sincere, according to your definition. Whoa. And so what he said, no, with this sincerity means you have no ulterior motives. You're not acting out of selfishness and self-benefit. You're not acting out of harm and fighting. This means you have a purity of heart, if you will. That's when some chung, that's what he said it meant. So then he said, wishing to be sincere in their thoughts, 
they first extended the utmost, their utmost knowledge, and knowledge to the utmost. And then it says such extension of knowledge lay in the investigation of things. And so I said, well, I, I, I read this master, I don't know what it means. He says, return the light to illumine within. The investigation of things is not nature. It's not a scientific inquiry. It's looking to the depths of your heart to see what's motivating it, what's there, really getting down to the primal impulses, desires, habits, and so forth. And once you get that straight, and then the text goes, very interesting. Then I understood it in a different way, because I had taken it to be knowledge of the world. But he was saying, no, it's self-knowledge. This is the uh, self-knowledge that Socrates was talking about. Things being investigated, then this knowledge became complete. This knowledge complete, their thoughts were sincere. Their thoughts being sincere, their hearts were then trued. And their hearts being trued, their persons were cultivated. Now cultivated means you're radiating with this bright virtue. You're really, um, how should I say, exemplary. You know, you're an inspiration, and not because you're trying to be, but just because you're such a genuine, true person. And then it says their person's being cultivated, their families then correspondingly attuned. And once the families were, then the states, and from the states, uh, the country was rightly governed and so forth. And then he said, now pay attention to this, this last line. It says, from the son of heaven, which is who? Not the S-U-N, S-O-N. Emperor. Emperor, or? Empress, or? God. No, not God. Son of heaven. The president. Yes. Mm. Down to the common people, all must consider that cultivation of your person is the root of everything else. Shoshan Weiban. So this text, interesting, I didn't have the text. He quoted it from memory in the car. I was like, wow. And he was also, he never finished school. And it was really interesting to me, how did he do that? I've been studying this for weeks. You know, he just quoted this text verbatim. I'm sure he was trying to translate it because he wasn't familiar with it either. Then Fang Wu woke up because she was Chinese schooled in the classics and she was correcting us. And it was a very animated conversation. Um, and then I kept thinking, cultivating your person is the root of everything else. That was what I was missing in those demonstrating years, missing when I was working with the kids. I didn't understand the root. I was working at the branches. I was working at the branches. And it's not to say that's not good or effective, but it wasn't deep enough. It wasn't transformative enough. It was, it was a superficial change. And I actually realized, and I didn't say it at the time to the master, was, and I truly hadn't gotten my own things rectified. You know, there's still elements of fighting and anger and whatnot motivating me. And so, the, but then out of the blue he said, how could you ever make world peace if you didn't have peace in your heart? Like boom. And so I thought, wow, this is really, really interesting. Then he said something that really has inspired me to continue. I'm, I'm past retirement now, as you can all tell, <laughs> as I digress and wander and can't remember things. Um, but I don't retire because he said, now you should understand why I'm starting schools elementary school, secondary school, most importantly, da shui. <laughs> you, dong -bu -dong, you get it? I thought, oh yeah, I like the da shui. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And he says it's called instilling goodness, developing virtue schools. Why? Because I want to have schools where this is at the core, this development of character. Then he said, I don't want them to become Buddhist necessarily. If they want to, fine. But if they go out into the world as doctors, engineers, educators, politicians, economists, they will bring this with them and this will have a profound radiant effect throughout the world. Once that character is there, whatever tool they pick up can be creative and good. He said the converse is also true. If they don't learn this in their formative years, then that knowledge becomes a power tool that can really hurt. And then he quoted another line, he said, so you should understand Virtue is the only power that can cut without harming. It, was a, it really, really stuck with me. Um, so I was just, wow, thinking about this really deeply. And then, um, so I, I'll, finish this, I'll finish the story. Uh, where I was going the, with this story was to say, this isn't to mean that that's all you do. And it doesn't mean that you don't do other things engaged in other ways. Um, being part of political parties, being part of reforming. I mean, there's 100,000 things you can do actively. 
But the activity must be grounded in and rooted in this if it's going to be deeply effective. So why I'm doing this and not out doing other things is I'm at this point in my life thinking if I can share these texts and these teachings with as many people as possible, it plants something of a root um, that could go out, especially working with younger people. Um, is it slow? Yeah, I'm sorry. And I get it, I, I, back in the 60s, I wasn't very impatient. When do we want peace? When do we want it now? You know, everything was wanted now. Um, and, you know, I discovered that it doesn't work that way very well. And sometimes, and this is from this text, this, the lines that finish, the biggest things begin in the smallest of places. And that, 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 that root. So I pull myself back in the sense of trying to think long term and you know, keep a program like this going so this is available and becomes maybe a stimulant to go for the root. After that's there, what people do is amazing. There's no limit. It doesn't mean you just sit in meditation all day. Quite the opposite. It's like wherever you're going, you're in a state of meditation even when you're engaged. And that's what the Six Patriarchs says. Everywhere engaged, nowhere attached. I mean, so this is Buddhist engaged teaching, but it, it's rooted in this part of it. If you prematurely go out to change the world without that self-transformation, you may not change it and you might actually mess it up. So it's sort of like, don't despair because of this particular election or whatnot. Man, I, okay, to go back, um, I was ready to leave the country in 68. I know this is webcast, but I don't care. Because um, somebody got elected. N-I-X-O-N, right? And I was like, okay, I'm out of here. I can't take this. Uh, and of course, without the, the commensurate virtue necessary, that president ended up getting impeached. But I was thinking, you know, wh where, where are you going to go? Wherever you go, you're going to have the same situation you're going to encounter. So I didn't do it there. And then, you know, for, for some of the younger students that were up at the city at you know, 19, 20 years old, it's like, wow, this is really, whoa, this is so heavy. I don't know if I want to go living on, you know. It's like, whoa, 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 wait, wait a minute, you guys. We had two Kennedys assassinated, Martin Luther King, we had the Vietnam War, my uncles came out of the Korean War, um, and you can go on and on, you know. So, and then you look at Han Shan, Shu Yun, and whatnot. These guys are tossed into jail, beaten near to death, and they just keep going on. So chill, this is the first, you know, and it won't be the only one. But you don't pull back if you know you're on the right path. You just keep your eyes on the prize, so to speak. So that's, I wanted to share that with you tonight. Not the sense to say that this is what I'm doing or am I advocating you do anything or not do anything, but that you attend to this route. Because even if you don't go any further than your family, it will radiate out and cause a transformative effect. And if you really think about it, well, everybody who had an influence, including Hui Nang, when we looked at Ajahn Mun, who was the you know, the inspiration behind the forest tradition, his and their energy keeps radiating through into decades and decades beyond them. And all they did was single-mindedly devote themselves to the root. They didn't try to start a movement. They didn't try to have, you know, a whole big thing happening. But the power, when your mind is focused in this way, I don't know what the limits are. So it, it could go on, you know, quite, quite amazing. So that's why you want to not lose faith and lose heart. Because one of my students said, well, it's so big, it's such a big problem, I'm so small. Don't go there. Don't go there. Because that just leads you to a sort of self-enforced passivity and a fatalism. And your chi will drain and you won't be a vital person anymore. So you just do what you can. Um, what was the other comment? Oh, this came up because the other person said, well, you know, as Buddhist, you know, it's like a little tricky getting involved in politics. We don't want to get involved in politics. Maybe it's better just to cultivate. And I'm sorry, if you look at the Avatamsaka, basically what the Avatamsaka says, you are involved in politics. To be human is to be involved in politics. You are in the network of things. You're no, you can't escape it, okay? <laughs> you cannot escape it. So the only thing you can do is refine your actions within it. But there's no way of, if you don't vote, that's a vote. You know, if you don't act, it's an act, and it has karma. So whether you act or don't act, vote or don't, because some people say, oh, I don't want to create any karma, I'm not going to vote. I talked to somebody in Wisconsin who was leaning that way. I said, I'm sorry, not voting is creating karma. Huh? <laughs> so it's not like we have a choice, but the choice we have is the quality of our engagement, our quality of our commitment. So I just the, so I guess the last part, we're, we're at, reached our time limit, but so I never had a conversation with a master like this before. And it was like, wow, because usually it was, 
Um, master, what? Well, I've been thinking that's false thinking. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I was like, okay, okay, you know. It was these one-liners that were not very satisfying. I was like, I was like, woo, buzzing, you know. And so, I thought, you know, I'm sure it's really transient. I see this beep, 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 the red light in the back of the mirror. Whoa. And so I pull over, and it's a CHP. And they pull me to the side, and all of a sudden, they knock on the window, bzz, lower the window. Boy, you realize how fast you were going? You know, sunglasses. Uh, no, officer, I, I didn't. I clocked you at 110. That's why it was a shorter trip. <laughs> uh, and I said, oh my gosh, I didn't realize. Well, you have to remember, this was that high-end Mercedes. At 110, it felt like it was 45. I mean, it was just like, you weren't even where you were going. And I was so excited with the conversation. I was, you know, I didn't even look at the dashboard. And he said, I'm going to write you a ticket, and you're going to be basically in deep doo-doo with this, because, you know, but I just want you to know. And then zzz, the back window goes down, where the master's sitting, and he's looking out, and he says, good morning, in, in English. And the officer says, uh, good morning. And he, he was sort of caught by the master's presence, so he stopped looking at me, he was looking at the master. And then the master said, ah, like this, shaking his finger to the back of my head, like I'm naughty. He said, First, mind speeding, then car speeding. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going, oh my. And the officer, the officer's kind of like, hmm, gets a little smile on his face. And he turns to me and he said, I'm going to rip this ticket up. <laughs> so he starts ripping the ticket up. And we go, oh my God, I'm saved, you know. And then I start to roll up my window and he puts his, you know, pad thing in there to stop the roll up. He said, however, my warning is not to you directly. I want you to slow down and be careful so you don't endanger that wise old man in the back seat. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> and then we're going and we're going, so I'm thinking like, oh, wait a minute. So how come I couldn't get out of that ticket and somehow the master did? And so I'm thinking, well, this will be a good conversation. So I say, master, how come because he saw you, he didn't do the ticket. When he saw me, he was going to give it to you. The master goes, hmm. And we were back to those ones, like, well, what am I to make of this? But obviously, I didn't have whatever was necessary to <laughs> move the CHP. Anyhow, uh, I share that with you. I don't know if it's consoling or medicine or whatnot, but it, it may be, I'm sharing my stories to say, um, I am here doing what I'm doing out of that kind of choice. And uh, although there's many things one can do, uh, you got to make sure that it's coming from this, this depth in this heart. And then the other thing is, no matter what, you don't turn back. There's an expression uh, in the Dharma that says, once you resolve on Bodhi, you want to reach the place of no retreat. No matter what, you don't retreat. Because if you don't retreat, eventually, you're bound to get there. It's only to be feared that you'll stop short and be moved. And I think it's the same thing with this. If this, what you feel is noble and worthwhile, then it's sort of like blip. I just come back and I just keep going and I keep going, like that pink bunny, the little batteries, you just keep going. Um, because the last thing you want to have is negative energy move you, internally or externally. When Klesha arises internally, you don't let it move you, and when something arises outside, you don't let it move. You just settle yourself, restore balance, and truck on. So anyhow, that's it for tonight. It was a diversion, of course, but you encouraged me to do it, so. <laughs> Yeah. So uh, we don't have time for questions, and maybe you do have some, but um, if they're really pressing, you could ask. Otherwise, we could save it for next week. But hopefully, we won't be wallowing in this week after week after week, right? He's not worth it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll do tell you something, though. Um, when one of the monks in the monastery was decided not to be a monk anymore, and he was going to go back, and get involved in engagement and go back to political life. Um, the master didn't scold him, he didn't be wary. He simply said, when you go out, be a bright light in a dark place. That's really, really beautiful advice. He said, wherever you go, just be a bright lamp, a bright light in a dark place. Um, but don't let your bright light be darkened. 
So, you know, I think it, it was really, really a nice tone of advice. Uh, so, light up. I mean, you know, bright, bright. <laughs> ming, ming, duh. I didn't mean light up that way, okay? <laughs> okay, announcements? Yeah, it was interesting. Doug and I chaired this at the city, so we took turns presenting and answering questions. And uh, you know, he has his own background and, and stories to tell regarding this. So if you come on, I guess Monday, you can see what Actually, he is. Seven, seven, seven o'clock on Monday, seven, yes. in the kitchen here, in the dining room. Okay. The other thing I want to say, and some of you may feel you understand this or buy into it and some of you don't, but I know from my years of experience with um, my teachers that there is another level of engaged Buddhism that isn't quite so visible, and that's what we're going to do next. And it's a, we call this transference. Now, you might think, oh, it's just a wish, and that's fine. Um, but there's something behind this that's deeper, especially if it's done really sincerely. So I'm not saying this is the only thing you do. It's just one of many things you do, but it orients your mind to say what goodness is generated by this gathering I wish to have go out to radiate. And that very thought changes your orientation. Now, at another level, there may be something going on, too, <laughs> that I, I know I've seen this happen, I can't explain it, but don't dismiss these kinds of rituals as being insignificant or not having an impact on the world. Um, they do. So, at least in my experience, they do. So, that's what we're going to do now. We're going to do the transference uh, in English. May every living being our minds as one and radiant with light share the fruits of peace with hearts of goodness luminous and bright if people hear and see how hands and hearts can find in giving unity may our minds awake to great compassion, wisdom, and to joy. May kindness find reward. May all who sorrow leave their grief and pain. May this boundless light break the darkness of our endless night. Because our hearts are one, this world of pain turns into paradise. May all become compassionate and wise. May all become compassionate and wise. Bingley Sun Bones.